October 19th, 1864. The Shenandoah Valley, breadbasket of the Confederacy, and the scene of a battle that would, in one bloody day, award victory to both sides. Cedar Creek, Bell Grove, Virginia. Well, we smashed them pretty hard at Winchester. Uh, we drove them right through the streets of the town. Uh, the southern girls were standing on the porch uh, crying when my regiment went through the streets of the village. The morale is, uh, is very low in the camps. Uh, after, after Tom's Brook and, and the fight at Fisher's Hill, every, everything, all the morale is pretty low. This, in, in essence, is their, is their bread basket. If they, can, if they can harvest what they need to harvest from this area and keep us out for a while, then they'll prolong the war. So I haven't seen people suffer as much as these people here in the valley. Sheridan stripped them of everything they own, crops, everything in the barns, well, burned the barns. Another, another example of why we started this war in the first place. Why we got into, why I got into service anyhow in the first place. We were told to make the valley secure so that the rebels could find no provisions here or any comfort. So in that case, we t drove off most of the livestock, burned the barns, basically left the people the sustenance to live on, and that's it. He's just moving through the valley like locusts. They're just destroying everything in their path. Damn Yanks, he won't stand and fight either. They keep moving, they keep moving one side of the valley to the other. You can't get a beat on them. We're Jersey men, and we don't make war on women and children. By the same token, if you're gonna feed the rebel army, then you're killing our men. I've lost a lot of my livestock that I've had here on the farm, whatever valuables that I've had that I've owned all my life, family possessions. And my cause for the efforts of this war are that I have lost two sons to the Confederate forces, but I'm a loyal Union supporter. The, the local folks are going to call this for years uh, the, the season of the burning, I'm sure, instead of, a, instead of a fall harvest like we had hoped for. If we can take the Shenandoah Valley, drive them out, cut them in half, they're not going to be able to supply their army. So we're General Sheridan, we're down here, and we're gonna drive them out of the valley. It was the good old days, old commissary banks running through the valley. Yeah. At least I had, had me a food. good blanket and stuff whenever we fought with him. We had, we had shoes and food then. Yes, we did. Yeah. We even had some lobster that time, remember? Yeah. Yeah. Them yeah. Lemon. Yeah. Lemon. It's some lobster. what? <laughs> shoes and trout. The soldier gets dehydrated, he's as good as a dead soldier. We question how long can they hold out? Well, they've managed to hold out for more than a year since Gettysburg, but they rely very heavily upon the food and the forage they can obtain from the valley, and that's going to be impossible this year. The, I don't know how the families that live here are going to make it through the winter. Tired. Come on. Guards, post. Okay, when we form up for the battle, I want you to form up facing the camp. I think General Early's orders are pretty clear that he has to do all that he can to to, to keep the valley, for the most part, in Confederate hands. Uh, I don't know how much longer we can hang on, uh, but my men have good spirit, and they're ready for a fight anytime. They will fight better if they were fed better. Assembled that fall were some of the most well-known officers of both sides. Different in stature, demeanor, personality, and leadership style, they all felt the same strong allegiance to their cause. General Early does not, uh, does not like the Yankees at all <laughs> and uh, tends to become most irascible at the drop of a hat. Usually will drop that hat himself. <laughs> My philosophy is kill as many damn Yankees as you can and quickly as possible. 
I need more infantry. Uh, cavalry can run away. Infantry don't run away. Old Jew, he like to cuss up a blue streak. He'll call you anything. He's a slugger. He likes to fight. Sheridan came from the west, and we didn't know what to make of him. Uh, he spoke some big words, but if he's all right with Grant, we figured we'll give him a try. And I'd have to say right now, there's none of us would change him for any other. I believe in discipline for the men, in duty, in honor, fidelity, trust, and the uh, spirit of corps. We're getting some better generals coming up through our ranks now. Uh, it, it means a lot when you go out in the field, you got a good general under you. Officers that know where to go, what to do. They don't get us caught in their ambush and get us cut to pieces. I think the strong cavalry officers are uh, Wesley Merritt and George Custer. They're young, vigorous, full of life, and uh, good leaders, good West Point leaders. They started finally using the cavalry uh, the way they should uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, when Joe Hooker got charge of the Army. And uh, instead of dividing us up and running us around as Oh, boot blacks and couriers and, and, and orderlies for a bunch of infantry generals who were out here fighting as a big group. And I think that uh, under Generals uh, Merritt and Custer, we'll, I think we'll win the day out here. General Custer, as he usually does, was looking pretty. He was always out in front. I, he's a brave man. I, I, I won't take that away from him. But he wants to be seen. And he was out there getting seen. The uniform I felt was needed. It kind of set me apart from everybody else. I've got an attitude. Everybody knows it. And if they, if they see me coming, well, Maybe they'll move aside. Custer, uh, he would, he'd finish last in his class. He was not a, a student at all, but yet we'd get him on the battlefield. He's, uh, he'll drive him every time. Colonel Rutherford Hayes has come in and he's uh, drilled the men. Company forward, march! Give them confidence. Seems to be a very good leader. And uh, William McKinley has set an example for the men. Taught them the school of the soldier. We do have uh, at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning, right here, a uh, courier from Richmond is delivering Confederate scrip. My strongest officer is General Gordon. Uh, he's, uh, I can count on him. Uh, sometimes I believe he's a little too aggressive, but I can count on him. General Ramser, very good men. There are some mighty fine gentlemen in the ranks that oppose us, but for the most part, they're not the high-toned gentlemen in, that occupy the ranks of this army. Yeah, General Ramster just uh, just today found out through the through the signal stations that uh, that his wife back in uh, North Carolina uh, just gave birth to the first uh, child. In fact, he found a flower somewhere and he's wearing it as a carnation in his lapel today um, to uh, to let everybody know that uh, that he's a daddy. Stay in calm, sir. Stay in calm. Win this battle, Colonel. Yes, sir. Earn that furlough and go home. See that Pray child. God it be so, sir. If it's decisive enough, we may all get to go home. Please me greatly. In every position, sir. Very good, Mike. General Gordon is a wonderful officer. Uh, he's a soldier, soldier, and a gentleman. I have no prior military training. Uh, prior to the, the struggle we're involved in. Uh, basically, uh, we, I enlisted as a private in the Raccoon Roughs in the hills of Georgia, and I found myself, fortunately, uh, in command of a gallant lot of men in a most unfortunate situation. Outnumbered 17,000 to 30,000, 
Jubal Early's Army of the Valley was hungry and running low on supplies. His most logical choices were to stay in the Blue Ridge and wait things out, or to join Lee's army in Richmond. But Early chose to take his chances on an unexpected and dangerous strategy, attack. And before sunrise, his forces prepared to do just that. We need to take pressure off General Lee and keep his valley opened up. It's essential we have this valley. We have no choice. We're here to fight, and fight we will do. So if we can come up upon the Yankees as fast and furious as possible, then, then we will deliver the blow as sharply as possible. The best tactics is our aggressive tactics. And God has granted us very aggressive leadership in this army. We shall prevail, sir. Sheridan's uh man of our army and we whipped the Rebs at the Fishers here a month ago and uh, we don't look for them to come back. I think they're gone from here. If Sheridan's successful in burning the Shenandoah, there will be no more food. The Army of Northern Virginia will starve in the trenches of Petersburg. We've, we've posted guards and pickets all across our line, right down by the creek actually, and we really don't expect any enemy movement. We haven't seen the enemy in God knows how long, so as far as we know, they may not even be around here. Scouts came back and said that it uh, doesn't look like there's much of a force line in the creek at all, which is unbelievable for Yanks. I decided to do a sneak attack because I don't think they're ready for us. They're not ready at all, matter of fact. They don't have their pickets out far enough. Uh, they're, they're very secure, and uh, we'll, we'll take care of that. And rumor has it that Sheridan, Sheridan's not even around, so maybe we can catch them, catch them when they're least expecting us. Well, I that'd be good. He's supposed to be up in Washington, ain't he? That's what the picket's been here. Maybe we'll catch him with the trousers down. If anyone can do it, Gordon can do it. Well, basically, General Early has ordered his entire command to move up in silence. No cups rattling, no noise, and we are to attack the Union camp in the early morning and perhaps route them as best we can. Remember, leave all your canteens, leave your heavy gear behind, uh, leave your cups, leave your canteen hats, leave all that stuff behind, it's gonna make any noise. We're gonna be marching all the way over to uh, Signal Peak and flank them damn Yankees. And General Gordon says, if he catches anybody making any noise, you're gonna wish you hadn't. If we're able to, uh, to route the Yankees, uh, what that'll mean is we can pick up all their supplies, all their ammunition, weaponry, uh, any footwear. It's getting cold here in the valley. Any blankets, tentage they have, any of their food, and the boys definitely need all of the above. God grant that we'll have a complete victory today. So often in recent days, we've been blunted before we could secure the fruits of a full victory. We have worked so many years for this, and if we can bring it off, I should gain be. that furlough. Yes, sir. And a well-deserved furlough with that. Just before dawn, Early's men, some of whom had marched and waded through icy water for seven hours, began their onslaught on a sleeping enemy. Uh, the general got us up this morning and, uh, well, actually it was la this past night, about 8 o'clock, we started out as soon as it got dark. In the middle of the night, uh, we, we had to wade the, the river there, the Shenandoah, the North Fork, and, uh, and then we, we hit the Yanks this morning, uh, along about 5 o'clock, just came screaming out of the fog and, and caught them napping.
We didn't expect the Confederates to mount any kind of an offensive at all, any kind of an attack. And when they came at us like that, we just, uh, I guess we, we figured, no, what do we do now? They weren't supposed to do this. I think they just caught us off guard. They were running like squirrels. The worst part of it was wading across that creek in the cold water and then having to lay in the grass for an hour, hour and a half, waiting for the battle to start. I'm like sure glad in order to go forward. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that was once I was glad to, to charge. Well, your brigade commander told us this was a safe area. We shouldn't have to worry. Safe to make your food, right. relax, and wait for orders. All of a sudden, screaming and yelling, people running right down through the company street. Chaos. People running through the streets, grabbing gear as much as you can, running as fast as you can. You don't even know if you got your own gear. Right. And there, some you fellas, start grabbing. Yeah, some fellas never, didn't even get a chance to get dressed. Running a lot of the fellas were running out there in their drawers, just grabbing any any rifle they and could the rifle find. Any rifle they came to. It was awful cold, too. You know, those cavalry fellas, they ride on horses all the time, but sometimes they just, I don't know, they go. They don't know where we are to get back to warn us. The pickets, well, I got some fresh peanuts here from a fella, so the pickets were probably out trading with each other instead of protecting us like they should have. Yeah. We, we were close to being whipped. All through the morning, we were taken by surprise, and, uh, and we, were, we were run out of our camps, and I thought the battle was lost. The general rule for a soldier in engagement is not to aim specifically at the enemy, but in the direction of a group of soldiers. You are not aiming so much at a specific man. One soldier once said, aiming directly at a man is tantamount to murder. No, don't fall forward. Walk, 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 walk. We've been fighting to die on the old campground. Many are lying here. Some are dead and some are dying. Many are in tears. Many are the hearts that are weary tonight, wishing for the war to see. Tenting tonight, tenting on the old campground. Dying tonight, dying tonight, dying on the old campground. There's nothing you can do but run if, if you're getting hit like, like we did. Um, a lot of times, you, there's nothing you can do when you see your comrade fall. Um, and just through that whole ordeal that morning, it's just you just seen guys left, left and right falling, too many casualties. We need to break. We can't hold them here. You've got to stop the line back there. We will hold here, sir. Well, I've heard through the, through the grapevine that uh, the General Gordon and uh, Stonewall Jackson's old map maker, Major Hotchkiss, uh, that they brought the plan to General uh, General Early, and uh, an old Jew could see the wisdom in it. A great day, great day. Eleven miles away in Winchester, Virginia, Union General Philip Sheridan sensed and then heard the desperate battle raging at Cedar Creek. He knew there was only one thing to do, ride. They may try to regroup and come back, but we think that we'll be able to push them out of the Shenandoah so that we can once again retain the breadbasket of the Confederacy. My understanding that General Wharton's division is supposed to come up the pike to our rear 
and move through Middleton, but I see no movement in that direction. Then it would appear to me that we're going to have to take care of that. You know how that... General Early can be about his prerogatives, sir. Yes, sir. Perhaps we should send Captain Pruitt to see if he can locate General Early and see what his intentions might be on this matter. Yes, sir. If that's not secured soon, then those people will have a way out. <laughs> and all of our efforts this morning will have gone to the north. You can't take anything from the Rebs. They've got spirit. They're wrong. They're the best men who ever fought in the wrong cause that there ever were. I don't think they that Mayor and Custer should have waited three hours before they reacted. My best guess is that Mayor and Custer didn't know what was going on. Once the shooting starts, nobody knows. Well, little Phil came down from Winchester and we saw him come in on his big gray horse. We just knew we could take him. So we reformed and we came back and we were ready to whip old Jubal early one more time. After a couple hours, they pulled us and the division out and moved us off to the left flank. And we fought for, oh, from about 9 o'clock a.m. till about 4 o'clock p.m. Um, over there in front of uh, Middletown uh, with the rest of the Army. I thought we had them all the way. We had them all the way. So Sheridan started coming back. <laughs> Where in the hell did he come from? Winchester. I mean, I had no idea he even was around. Uh, the return of Sheridan was the thing that, uh, the, the, the maneuver that threw the victory to our side. Without Sheridan, I don't know that uh, federal forces could have won this battle. But uh, his return from Winchester just electrified the troops and put the, put the uh, iron in their backsides again. Did you see him ride on the field? There wasn't a man flew his back to the enemy when Phil came down the lane. Finally, by midnight, the shooting was over. What was left of both armies now had only to deal with the devastation. Although the Union Army now had control of the Shenandoah Valley, both sides suffered massive losses that day.
what we heard about what happened at Cedar Creek. You'll have to pardon my voice. A little throat wound at the wilderness is doing me in a little bit. What we heard about what happened at Cedar Creek, Jubal Early chased him out of town, actually pushed him right out of town. Stopped right at the edge of Middletown. Why he stopped, I don't know. Uh, if he'd gone on pushing them, uh, he might could have could have annihilated them in detail. Still, they never knew what hit them. They had no idea we were there. That march couldn't have been made by any army but us. They they, they had no idea we were there. The we crushed so them. The Seventh Corps doesn't exist anymore. The thought was so thick we were on them before they even got out of the tents. All they, they were boiling their coffee and making up their breakfast. Why, they didn't know what was happening to them. Their beds were still warm. They, uh, they had no, no idea we were there. They had no idea we could make that move. But we did it. Damn, we did it. Damn, we'll, damn we'll do it again. We should have never stopped. We should have right. kept pushing them right out of the valley. The boys were hungry, man. Jubal Early had no choice but to wait. Uh, his men were very low in supplies. They had not really eaten well in several weeks. And once they overran the federal camps, I don't think uh, General Lee himself could have kept the men from foraging through the camps. We're soldiers. We're so we've got to keep going. But uh, you, you can't lead a horse to, uh, to grass and not expect him, to expect him not to eat. I can't believe that the Sixth Corps came all the way up here to Richmond. Lordy, I wish that the Sixth Corps would just go straight to Kingdom Come. They've been a thorn in our butts going on four years now, haven't they? Yeah, we got that right. Well, our, our losses initially seemed to be quite severe because we had a, a large number of men who were either captured or knocked loose from their command in the first attack. We did initially lose some guns, but they were subsequently recaptured, I believe, by the cavalry at the end of the day. Well, we lost a lot of guys today. After we pushed the Rebs back, we had blue all over the field. Yeah, it was like a blue carpet, great big blue carpet. It was just unbelievable. My tent mate went down today. Uh, just there's so much, so much loss, so much death. We lost one of our promising young officers from Massachusetts, Charles Russell Hall, and it's a, it's a shame. And I'm not sure how my men will react to this. It's devastating. It's very difficult fighting against the fellows that you went to the point with. They, um, they're as good as you are, if not better. And you know that they were they were taught the right way. Um, what's more difficult is knowing that you might come face to face with them, and it's going to be you or them. That hasn't happened yet, and I don't know how I'm going to handle it. But I guess we'll find out when the time comes. I've had two damn horses shot out from under me already. Bring that mail up here. All right, sir. Hit, hit through the chest, through, through both lungs by the look of it. 
They were able to get him on a horse and get him off. Uh, I've heard he's been captured and he must be dead, hit like that. I know that. I'll get some pressure on it. Just relax. Pack it. We're going to give him some medicine for pain. And make him comfortable. And I think the best thing to do would be to move him someplace else. We are presented with soldiers from both armies. And we do tend to treat our soldiers first from the Union Army. But we do treat our Confederate wounded in addition. As they come in, we deal with them as we would do. We're, we're physicians and we have, uh, our, our main job is healing. It's very unique here at this field that supposedly one of the great and upcoming stars of the Army of the Potomac is General George Custer. And one of his very best friends is dying here at Bell Grove from wounds received leading his troops into battle here on this field. And dear Lincolnton, my home. These recent battles and defeats will make it almost impossible to leave this army. To be separated from you is to lose it all. If I could just see Nellie one more time. Hold on, hold on. Today was a tough day. I uh, we lost my brother in the first 10 minutes of the battle. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to tell my mother. General Early's always blaming us for one thing or another. I've never seen a man look for so many excuses. Well, this time I think he's got a legitimate grape. As far as I can see, I think that hurt us. We had him gone, we should have kept on chasing him, and, and formations just broke. Nothing you could do, I mean. We didn't expect him to come back down that hill. It was, you know. <laughs> Captain, he can't blame it on us. Well, I march when they tell me to march, and I fight when they tell me to fight. I can't do no more than that. You Nobody can. You don't think the general's going to blame himself, do you? It's not for me to disagree with my commanding officer, but I can think our men did all that they could do. It's hard to ask a man to fight like that when he's hungry, like they were. It was incredible, the tenacity that they had. It is just incredible that I practically saw the dead rising up and coming back after us. It, it was very demoralizing, very demoralizing indeed. The men certainly covered themselves with glory, if, if but nothing else. <laughs> Scum spoiled our breakfast. Yeah, they came out, they Little came out. Phil came back and spoiled their dinner. Dinner, yes, yeah. sir! Yeah. Yes, sir! With the surviving Confederate troops fleeing, captured, or in disarray, the Union had only to look towards securing the valley and concentrating on its last push against Lee's defenders in Richmond. The Battle of Cedar Creek was the beginning of the end. War is almost over. The Confederates are all used up. So I would think, being uh, trying to think like General Sheridan, he's definitely going to start pushing hard and pushing towards Richmond. We're so short of competent generals. So many of our generals have been, have been killed or wounded and taken out of service. Nothing will happen to Jubal early. He's a good general. He just had a bad day. This valley's gone, boys. Yeah, With it goes early. With the loss of the valley, we know 
that there's not going to be many rations this winter. Uh, I expect that uh, we'd be eating rats pretty soon. I think we've pushed the Rebs out of the valley now, and that's real important. It was like a doorway to Washington. And if we can keep that secure, then we can do the business to them and, and take the war to them. You can't let the enemy hit you with the stick and let him run away with you. You gotta go after him. Sorry, but McClellan just won't let us do that. So we have to have Mr. Lincoln behind us. Get us back under one, one flag. There's a lot of, lot of dead Yankees up the road. I know we got whipped, but there's a lot of them dead. And I'm, I gotta believe I read in the Yankee paper that they're having riots because they're tired of the government taking these men into the military. And I gotta believe that these Yankees are getting sick of this war, as sick of it as we are more. Go, go, go! Oh, boys, push! I just want to walk across my fields at home, my farm, where it's green. Sure did them burn? And not know that I'm gonna get shot at going across it. But I sure miss seeing my kids. I, I, I don't live all my but barns. two miles up the pike here, and they won't let me even go home and see my own kinfolk. They said, we got to stay in camp. Hell, you try to leave, damn picket shoot you. Because you're desertion. I heard Hell, I ain't deserting or nothing. I just want to go home and see my mom. The boys from Georgia, we don't know where we're going home to. But I can only trust uh, that my family is well. I know my wife is well, for my wife is with me. But I don't know the rest of my family. I've got my command scattered halfway down this valley. We're trying to rally people and to find a point where we can all uh, reorganize. But right now, so many of the men in full retreat, I think eventually it'll be for us to join General Lee at the trenches of Petersburg and defend Richmond and Petersburg. Iron is seeing battlefields and bodies and horses, horses corpses. dead. What I'm going to miss is going back home. My friends aren't going to be there. Lost too many in this war. I think I'm scareder than I've ever been before. I've heard too many things. I've seen too many things. I'm tired of seeing things. I wish I could just somehow write home and have them come get me. I just hope that we come out on the winning side, if there is a winning side. This war will be over in three months. Just keep praying for us, pray for our safe return home so we can be together soon. Tell my wife I love her and uh, my children. Daddy will be home as soon as he can. I, uh, I fight for Virginia to my to my death, but I, I think we're I think we're about at our end here. I think the end is near, and I have every confidence in <coughs> the grace of God that I will finish this up and I will be home. cause is uh, my home is lost and I, th I think the, the cause for me is lost. We should all go home. Let bygones be bygones. It's over. Thousands upon thousands of men gone. Buried in Virginia. All out in the snow they are tonight. Far away from kin and home, God help the ones who fight for the right, and them who are done gone on. Poor soldier, hungry and cold, Poor soldier, hungry and cold. I know not where he is tonight. God alone only knows. Keep 
keep him safe and sound from all harm. Protect him from all foes. Poor soldier, hungry and cold. Poor soldier, hungry and cold. Lee's surrender didn't end the war. Weeks later, in May of 1865, John J. Williams was the last man to be killed in the conflict. In August of 1866, Texas, the final state to hold out, agreed to President Johnson's conditions of reconstruction. As for those who fought at Cedar Creek, they ultimately met with very different fates. The loss at Cedar Creek ended Jubal Early's military career. Never finding a place to settle after the war, he lived in Cuba, Canada, and Mexico before returning to Louisiana, where he died in 1894 at age 77 of complications from shock after a fall. Philip Sheridan continued his military career, participating in the final siege of Richmond and Lee's surrender at Appomattox. He later fought along with Custer in the West, where he agreed to the massacre of Native Americans. Married at 44 and the father of four children, he died at age 52 of heart problems. As an officer, George Armstrong Custer fought on in Virginia and Texas, but was hated by his men. He married, moved west, and died in the Battle of Little Bighorn after coordinating the slaughter of countless Native Americans. General John Gordon, a war hero, returned with his wife and family to his native Georgia. He did not do well in business, but was successful in politics, becoming the Grand Dragon of the realm of Georgia in the newly formed Ku Klux Klan. In 1873, he was elected to the United States Senate, where he became a leading voice for fairness, union, and Southern rights. William McKinley and Rutherford B. Hayes, both of whom served with the federal forces at Cedar Creek, were also successful in politics. Each was elected president of the United States, Hayes in 1876 and McKinley in 1896. Had Charles Russell Lowell lived just a few more days, he would have received the letter making him a general. He was buried in his home state of Massachusetts with those honors. His funeral was held at Harvard University. Stephen Dotson Ramser's body was delivered to a friend and was buried in his hometown in North Carolina. His wife, totally distraught over his death, and his three-week-old daughter did not attend the funeral. Ninety-five years after Cedar Creek, Walter Washington Williams, said to be the last surviving veteran of the Civil War, died at age 117. He claimed never to have fired a shot. You're cheating at cards. How dare you encourage you into my mind? Why are you? Sergeant, there's an inspection coming. Please. Control now, now yourself. The colonel's coming. The colonel's coming. Hey. You go over there. Put his pants on the same as I do. Thief. I dare you question my integrity. Integrity? You got no integrity. You're a but thief you rogue. And a liar. A oh, liar I am. I. You're my liquor's buddy talking. You're. Yeah. Why? Hey, Irishman is what you want. Cut off, Jackie. What the colonel? Hey, colonel, colonel, colonel. 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 Attention, company. Captain Brown, we're coming here for inspection. Yes, sir. Very well. Officers, parade. 
Yes, this ball will come in soon enough. Yes, sir.
That's how we know. understand it. All this blood and suffering and you're impressed by smoke rings.
and I sure tears all to make the blood to spill. He chose his time when Phil was gone, the Yankee camp to fall upon. That night, like thief, sense bereft, he marched his troop around our left. With orders strict unto his boys, to nothing they could make a noise. Get out of the way, says General Early, I've come to drive you from the valley. While they were on their mission bed, we Yanks were sleeping in our tents. Until the Revs would rouse and volley, warned us that sleep was death and folly. Called Early carried out his plan, surprising troop in his command. Who had not time their lines to form, so sudden came the rebel storm. Get out of the way, says General Early, I've come to drive you from the valley. Now when the day was almost lost, God sends a reinforcing host. The host he sends is but a man, but that's the noble Sheridan. On, on he comes with lightning speed, crying, who hath done this awful deed? He better fare neath southern skies, who dares my sleeping camp surprise? Get out of the way, says Phil to early, you've come too late to get the valley. Then orders flew from left to right, and glorious was the evening tide. The rebels fled with the cannon's roar, losing all they'd gained and thousands more. Round their flank brave Custer flew, as other cavalry ne'er could do. Capturing guns well nigh three score, including those we'd lost before. Get out of the way, says Phil, early, you've come too late to get the valley. Three cheers for Emory, Crook and Wright. Corbett and Merritt and General Dwight. Three for Custer and his command, our Union and General Sheridan. God bless our nation and her sons, and may this bloody war be done. May North and South united stand as once they were a happy land. Get out of the way, says Phil Early, you've come too late to get the